Hello everybody, Rocks Box 90 here with another and final Commander 2013 spoiler video. So we're going to try to move pretty quick because we have all five Commander decks fully spoiled and the rest of the main spoilers that I saw put out that are new cards. So we'll start off with Unexpectedly Absent, 2 white and X for an instant, put target non-land permanent into its owner's library just beneath the top X cards of the library. And if they said the rules text, if you do zero, it goes on top of the library. Holy cow, this card's insane. This is a legacy playable card. Yep, and not just because they say so for Daily MTG on the website they talk about it. It is crazy. The fact that you can time ebb the, uh, for cheaper, time ebb, well not cheaper, but for white, time ebb and put any non-land permanent, not just a creature, on top of his owner's deck is already pretty good in Legacy for two mana. Because any non-land, you're Planeswalker, you're going to use it, I'm going to instant speed, put it on top of your deck. And of course, the fact that you can, the, it scales, that the further, the further along the game you are, the more you can tuck it away, is insane. But what makes it really crazy is it works insanely well with any shuffle effects, which in Legacy are all over the place. Between fetch lands and tutors, there's tons of special shuffle effects. Since you can do this instant speed, you do it for two when, on any permanent when your opponent is going to shuffle their deck. They have to put the card on top of the deck and then they shuffle it into their deck on their own. So in EDH this is insane removal for commander, it's insane removal for any non-land permanent, and in Legacy you can use this on everything from Planeswalkers to Tarmogoyfs, whatever you name it, you use their own shuffle to make them lose one of the most important cards. And the fact that it's flexible enough non-land permanent makes it insane. So yes, this card is legacy playable. It is definitely EDH playable. It's fantastic removal at instant speed. Yeah, I don't know what else to say. It's great, and the art is brilliant. Then we have Darksteel Mutation, which is a really fun commander aura. Two, for an enchant aura, you enchant a creature. The creature becomes a 0-1 insect artifact, creature with indestructible and loses all abilities. Infinitely powerless. Great flavor text, really good. And the fact is, you use it on your opponent's creatures, particularly their commander, and their commander becomes useless. The fact that it's indestructible matters, though, because yes, their commander can block on the ground, since it's indestructible now, but they can't really kill their own commander easily. They can't wrath the field to get their commander from the command zone. Like, usually, if someone locks down a commander, you can wrath the field or kill your own commander to put it back in the command zone. By making it indestructible, it's really, really hard to kill your own commander, and so it basically locks down the commander from the game. Against Voltron, this is a really, really powerful card, but I think in general, the fact that it works on any creature is fantastic. You give them a very weak blocker that, yeah, it can be annoying, but a weak blocker, and you take away their one of their most powerful creatures. Fantastic passivism effect, great for EDH commander. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Then we have um, Order of Succession, I think this was, these were official if I remember right. Four, choose left or right, starting with you and proceeding in the chosen direction. Each player chooses a creature controlled by the next player. Each player gains control of a creature he or she chose. So pretty much it's a way that you can shuffle off the creatures on the field. It'll probably be a fun multiplayer card, something insane. What's annoying is the player that doesn't have a lot of creatures basically, that has no zero creatures, ends up with none at the end of the day. But it's still, I think, pretty interesting card. Shattergreen Brothers is the Goblin Artificer, the Jund, one of the Jund commanders from the deck. Very, very interesting because there aren't that many Goblin legendaries that you can use in Jund colors. And this one is very flexible. Three, sack a creature, each player sacks a creature. Three, each other player. Three, sack an artifact, each other player sacks an artifact. Three, sack an enchantment, each player sacks an enchantment. So yeah, it's a bit tough to get off the ground, but as a utility commander, I think late game, not late game, mid to late game, it's very, very flexible and the abilities allow you to really... Um, do a lot of fantastic removal. Great card. From the Ashes is a better Runation. It destroys all non-basics, but for each land destroyed, its controller searches its deck for a basic land and puts it into the battlefield. So it's really, really good if you want to run Runation, but you don't want people to hate you. This is a card that has a lot of potential that way. Restore, or Repair, it was in a foreign language, so I think Restore sounds better. Two for a sorcery, put target land from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. Wow, this is a card, this is a house, and this is possibly legacy playable. The fact that you can take any land card from anybody's graveyard and gain control of it, so all utilities, wastelands, all dual lands, 
there are so many cards that this can go crazy with, especially that you come out ahead. You strip mine or wasteland. Well, you can't strip mine in Legacy. You can strip mine in EDH. But you destroy one of their lands that's really powerful and you take it, that's fantastic ramp. It's really, really good. And of course, in Legacy, with the amount of fetches going on and the amount of wastelanding, a card like this, even early game, can be, you know, it can be like a far seek effect, but far seek for a better card. Very, very cool, very flexible. Love it. Then we have Price of Knowledge, which I missed last night. Seven players have no maximum hand size at the beginning of each opponent's upkeep. It deals damage to that player equal to the number of cards in that player's hand. It's each opponent, so it's seven mana for a reason. The fact is it's very, very good against control players, decks that run a lot of card draw, because you play this card, it locks down the field. Everyone can have as many cards as they want, but suddenly everyone's taking tons of damage for holding onto cards. So the only one who will be able to really hold onto cards is you. It's... I think too costly for seven, but I think for casual EDH, this card could definitely see some play. It's very, very fun, and the flavor is fantastic. It's like he's he lost his eyes to gain knowledge. It's awesome. Okay, then we have the five commander deck list. So I'm going to spend the rest of the video just focusing on them, and we're going to talk about two aspects. One, how playably put together are they? Is it worth buying to play with? And two, how much value are in the sets? So we'll start off with Eternal Bargain. This is the Aloro deck. And Aloro himself is a fantastic general. Really is. Very, very flexible. Very fun. The card draw engine of him it makes him very, very dangerous, even though he costs six mana. So all the decks have, I believe they all have Command Tower, Temple of the False Gods, and Soul Ring. There might be one other thing they all have, but I'm pretty sure they all have that. So you're going to be getting Commander Staples no matter what. Soul Rings are running between $5, 10 $15 anyway. So if you're getting... The Soul Ring, and you're getting Temple of False Gods, a Commander Staple, Command Tower, it's what, five bucks, five, ten bucks. It's used in every single Commander deck. So you're already starting off with between five and fifteen dollar value just from the staples. The deck itself seems pretty decent. I don't really see a hundred percent. It works with Aloro. It has a lot of life gain. You have things like a Divinity of Pride, you have Azorius Herald, you have these cards that focus on gaining you life and you set you. You gain life, you gain life, you gain life. Lots of gaining life stuff going on here, which is pretty good. Um, it's really for those who like messing around with Esper colors. Sharoom is one of the shards general who you could switch him out for, and Sharoom is, of course, famous for being very, very powerful combo piece artifact Esper lady. You get lots of good cards like Sphinx, Stormscape, um, Wall of Reverence is, of course, for life gain. So basically this deck is very much heavy on artifacts and life gain. If you like those styles, seems like it gives you pretty much what you want from there. You get a lot of the staples, you get a lot of cool stuff. Some of the cards have new art, such as Dromer's Charm here. doesn't show it, but it has new art in the set, the set version. And we have things like Limdult Fault, Neverall's Disc, which is used all over the place. It's a very popular Wrath effect. We have um, what uh, any other serious value in this deck. Well of Lost Dreams is fantastic for life gain, crawl space. Okay, maybe, um, oh, brilliant plan. There are, this is important, there are Portal Three Kingdoms cards in these decks. So now we're shifting, so it's a lot of fun if you're running Esper Colors, and it seems like it will work. Albite, it's a little awkward on the card choices. It's not necessarily the most perfectly put together deck. Change some things. It has a lot of the curses, for example, that may not be that good unless you're running budget, whatever. But <clears throat> these sets do include Portal Three Kingdom cards, which tend to be very expensive, so that does sway the deck's value. Brilliant Plan is not one of the better ones. And so this deck's raw value, not quite sure it's there, but it is definitely worth the initial price, the MSRP price, of course. Get this deck if you really want to run Esper Colors, get Esper Staples and have fun, because it seems like a deck that could be a lot of life gain fun to play with. Um, Nature of the Beast with the Maroth deck is next. This one is very, very token-driven. Again, we have Temple of the False Gods, we have Command Tower, and we have Soul Ring, like the rest of them. This one has, it's a little more creature-heavy than the Esper build. Uh, we get things like Avenger of Zendikar for beatdown and tokens. We get Crater Helion. We get Dream Hunter, which for bigger creatures you gain life. You have Gahiji. Um, what else do we have here? We have a lot of beasts going on, so we do have the Crows and Warchief for good reason. Um, Maroth is a beast also, to keep in mind. Spellbreaker Bemoth is very, very powerful in EDH. Ramaging Baloth, also very good. Um, in terms of spell effects, we have 
uh, anything in particular that's really, really powerful. I don't remember. Harmonize, of course, is a really great draw effect. Savage Twister, just skimming through. I, I skimmed through it before, but I don't remember. Uh, Wrath of God. So overall, again, this one is not a crazy value-heavy set, but it seems really, really fun in terms of people who like to run a lot of beatdown and uh, creature tokens, large heavy, large beatdown creatures, manipulating counters, all sorts of stuff. That's what this deck seems to do really well. And similarly to this deck, you have the Power Hungry deck, which is Jund. So Jund and Naya, both in EDH, tend to be um, tokens slash aggro focused most of the time. And so Parash's deck is a little different because it's much more token based than the Naya one, which is interesting in of itself. To notice also, we have here Hu, uh, Hua To, the Honor Physician. It's like a $60, $70, $80 card from Portal 3 Kingdom. So the deck the value of this deck suddenly is value. It's real value. Just because you'll get this card. Obviously, it won't be worth the same as its Portal 3 Kingdom compatriot. But if you're trying to get the Portal 3 Kingdom card, this, this deck will have it. Very, very good card. In terms of the, the other value from this one, we got... Um, what else do we have here? Uh, Creature-wise, I think that's the main value. We have Goblin Sharpshooter, staple, very well-known Goblin card. In terms of um, other stuff, we have, well, that's, I mean, that's kind of the real value of this one. Remember Incarnation, it's a pretty good card from Legends. Um, Spoils of Victories and other Portal 3 Kingdom cards with Boots, uh, Claw, Reliquary. It, it just seems like a lot of fun. This is a little more of a casual build in terms of the deck because tokens tend to be out of the box, these sort of token decks have to be a little more casual. They don't have a lot of the major staples. They don't have things like Doubling Season or any of the major doublers. They don't have any of the Planeswalkers. There are a lot of cards that really, really drive token decks, and this one doesn't really have any right now. But they have some pretty good staples, and this has a serious value card in it. Again, that's kind of what the main reason you'd get this set for. In terms of the Mind Seas deck, this one right now is retailing at the highest amount. And probably with good reason, because this deck has a lot of, it has a legacy card, Baleful Strix. That's a big deal in and of itself. Um, it has Thraxum Under, who's been going up in terms of value. So we have a couple of major money cards already in the creatures. Uh, Baleful Strix is about $25 right now, so that's a big deal. I remember seeing there was a Portal 3 Kingdoms card, with Decree of Pain, legacy, uh, not legacy, EDH staple. And we got... I remember there was a Portal 3 Kingdoms card, not Prosperity. Okay, I'm missing it. There was another one in the set, uh, I'm not sure where it is, that was also fairly expensive, um, and I think it's pretty, pretty good. But we have the Cruel Ultimatum is having the newer, I think it's going to have the newer art. Basically, what I want to say about Jaleva is that the deck itself seems interestingly put together. The creatures really don't, matter as much. It's going to be a spell-heavy deck because that's what Jaleva is herself, and so if you want to run a deck with lots of spells, this is a deck for you. In terms of value, as I said, you get uh, you get a couple of serious value cards, including a legacy staple, so it'll probably move boxes because of this, and so if you're worried about your value getting the set, you shouldn't be because it's it should have a couple of solid cards in it, though it is retailing at a higher value for that. Then we have Evasive Maneuvers, which is the last one, the Bant one. I personally like this one the best because it seems the most put together in terms of playing. If you want a deck that's out of the box the most playable, in the last Commander block we had Heavenly Inferno with the Kalia build that was the most playable, functional, awesome out of the box. I think this one is. And it spreads its value a little more across the cards because you have things like, you get things like a Zami, um, you get things like... Uh, Karmic Guide, you get things like Lujun, you get Mirror Entity, Merc Fiend Liege. You have a lot of these cards that are spread out value across the board. They're not just a couple of single cards. And we get other um, pretty awesome stuff, including the Unexpectedly Absent, which I think would be pretty awesome. And this, I think, is the only deck that has it. So if you're trying to decide which deck you want to go, really, they're all pretty awesome. All right, so those are my general thoughts. Sorry, it's a long video, but... We have all the deck lists, so it's a bit of a discussion. If you guys have any questions or thoughts about these decks, if you want any advice from me or you want to talk about it, definitely leave comments in this comment section. You can also PM 
me directly on my channel. Stay tuned for more spoiler coverage and other Magic the Gathering content by subscribing. Roxabox90 signing out. I'll see you guys next time.